It was Oscar season again, with Rain Man winning four awards. Best Picture, Best Director for Barry Levinson, Best Actor for Dustin Hoffman, and Best Original Screenplay for Ronald Bass and Barry Morrow. With Jodie Foster winning Best Actress for her role in legal drama The Accused, and Best Supporting Actor Gongs going to Kevin Klein for A Fish Called Wanda, and Gina Davis for The Accidental Tourist. Winning the award for Best Animated Short was Tin Toy, directed by John Lasseter, a former Disney animator who was working for the computer graphics division of Lucasfilm, called Pixar. The company's core product, an advanced but expensive graphic machine named the Pixar Image Computer, wasn't selling well, and Lasseter's team were making animations to demonstrate its capabilities. With the animation department under threat of closure to save money, Tin Toy was a timely success, winning an Academy Award which brought Lasseter and Pixar to the attention of his former employers, Disney, who thought that maybe a full-length movie about moving toys might now be viable. At what became known as the Polish Round Table Talks, the ruling Communist Party, led by General Jaruzelski, ended with an agreement to restore the controversial trade union Solidarity's legal status and to hold elections in June. Similar to the situation in the Soviet Union, only 35% of the seats in the lower house, the same, were to be open for free election, but all 100 seats in the newly reconstituted Senate would be open to any candidate, and a completely free election was promised for four years' time. The semi-finals of the English FA Cup took place in April. The Cup semis are traditionally played at a neutral ground, so fans of Everton and Norwich headed for Villa Park in Birmingham to watch a 1-0 win for Everton, while Liverpool and Nottingham Forest played at Hillsborough, the home ground of Sheffield Wednesday. In images that have become notorious, overcrowding developed among Liverpool fans in the stands, but between security efforts focused on the possibility of hooliganism and the tall fences erected to keep fans off the pitch, the fans were pushed against the barriers and began to be crushed while police and stewards, with the game having just kicked off, tried to confine what they saw as crowd trouble. In the end, 96 fans died in what became known as the Hillsborough Disaster, a number which became 97 in 2021, when fan Andrew Devine died of the irreversible brain damage he received that day. South Yorkshire police spent the next few days leaking stories to the press about the drunken behaviour of Liverpool fans, as most famously published in tabloid paper The Sun which is why you can't buy it in Liverpool very easily these days. But the subsequent Taylor report into the catastrophe found that, in fact, the main cause was incompetent or non-existent crowd control by the police. The initial coroner's inquest recorded accidental death, and a campaign for justice for the 96 to get the verdicts reassessed continued until 2016, when it was revised to unlawful killing. The F1 crews, meanwhile, headed to Italy for the first European race of the season, the San Marino Grand Prix at Imola. McLaren had been there early, testing for a full eight days before the race weekend, numerous configurations of car and engine, determined to do better than they had in Brazil. Ferrari, whose home fans would be expecting great things after Mansell's win in Rio, were being publicly cautious, saying their car and its cutting-edge gearbox still weren't quite right. McLaren weren't the only ones working feverishly after Brazil. Going down the entry list, Tyrrell had a new 018 chassis for Michele Alboreto, with Palmer still using last year's 017. Williams had bigger brakes and a new rear wing, and Renault had been doing some reliability work on the engine. Arrows had modified the fuel tank on Cheever's car to enable him to fit in it better. March still had their old car, the 881, but now it sported a green airbox for new sponsors BP. Minardi had also been testing at Imola and made some improvements, while their new car was still not quite ready. The LaRousse team, the team had quietly dropped Calmels from their name, had two of their new chassis, the Lola LC89, ready for their two drivers, though a falling out with Magnetti Morelli meant that they'd be using untried new Bosch spark plugs. And Gabriele Tarquini would officially join the AGS team to bring them up to a two-car entry. Tarquini's arrival meant that the entry list for this race was a whopping 39, the highest in Grand Prix history. Tarquini, taking over Streff's AGS, didn't need to pre-qualify, so again, 13 cars went out early on Friday, but this time with just four places up for grabs. Just as in Brazil, the Brabhams were quickest again, Modena first this time, with Caffey nearly two seconds off Stefano's time, and Larini fourth. The Onyx cars had improved immensely in the intervening month, with Gasho fifth and just missing out, beating his teammate Johansson, with the Germans Schneider and Weidler bringing up the rear, the latter having tried all three available chassis during the session. 
McLaren's extensive testing had paid off, and normal service was resumed as the pair dominated qualifying. Senna taking his 31st career pole two tenths ahead of Prost, with Mansell the best of the rest but trailing in their wake 1.6 seconds off pole. Patrese continued Williams's renaissance in fourth, splitting the two Ferraris with Boots in sixth, so once again it was McLaren, Ferrari and Williams taking up the top six. Nanini and PK were next, but row five was a real turn up for the books as Caffey's Delara was ninth alongside young Guiar's Ligier which had been fastest through the speed traps. Martini was an equally impressive 11th in the ageing Minardi, ahead of Warwick and Capelli. Tarquini was 18th in his AGS debut. Chiva could still only manage 21st, but Peter disappointed Brundle and Herbert, the latter having had to use the spare Brabham and then gone off. Nakajima was even worse off 24th, after having to have his engine changed. Palmer and Dalmas brought up the rear, with Alboreto missing out by just 0.07 seconds after a raft of new car teething troubles. He was joined in DNQ land by his former Ferrari teammate, briefly, Arnu, and Dana and Moreno. And so those 26 lined up on a sunny day near Bologna for the race on Sunday afternoon, with Jonathan Palmer now in the new Tyrrell, but not really expecting much more than a test session from the untried car, literally just off the production line. Dalmas peeled in at the end of the parade lap with faulty spark plugs. And the rest tore away when the green light went, with Senna keeping ahead of Prost, who had quickly got Mansell hustling him as they streamed round into Toza, and Patrese was hanging on to fourth despite Berger's attentions. By the end of lap one, Senna was already pulling away from Prost, who was in turn leaving Mansell behind to the attentions of Patrese. The Italian seemed revitalised by the performance of the new Williams Renault and was all over his former teammate looking for a way past, while Bootson sat behind Berger, likewise hoping for an opportunity. The Lola Lamborghinis had been dropping oil all the weekend and on lap two, Capelli spun on it out of seventh, by which time both Lolas had already retired with ignition problems, and then at the start of lap four, Berger speared off at Tamburello going straight into the wall at some 170 miles an hour, careening along at shedding parts and then coming to rest. And then the Ferrari caught fire. The Italian marshals, Wikipedia gives their names as Bruno Mignati, Paolo Verdi and Gabriele Violi, had the fire out as quickly as humanly possible, but Berger had still been alight for nearly 30 seconds by the time he was extinguished. The red flags came out and the race was stopped, while Gerhardt was extracted from his cockpit and airlifted off to Bologna Hospital, reportedly conscious and talking to the medical team. The relieved but shaken remainder reassembled on the grid for the race to continue as everyone tried to work out what had happened to the Ferrari. None more so than the Ferrari team themselves, of course, particularly Nigel Mansell, who was making a decision about whether to get back in his identical car for another start. Bernie Eccleston advised him not to, but depending on who you believe, either Nigel was made of sterner stuff or his new team put pressure on him not to disappoint the fans. Either way, he got back in for another go. Thierry Bootsen had picked up a puncture on the same lap as Berger's accident, possibly from some debris, and the Williams team were just about to start replacing the offending tyre on the grid when starter Ronald Brunscherider insisted that they couldn't work on the car on the grid and they'd have to push it to the pit lane. After some argument from the team, they duly did so, and Bootsen would have to start from the pit lane and make his way up from the back. The Scuderia Italia team were in a similar position, with Caffey having tangled with Griard and got a puncture of his own, and like Williams, the unhappy team pushed Alex back to the pits for a change. But Griard's Ligier had also been damaged, needing a new undertray, and the team had already jacked it up on the grid, taken off the wheels, replaced the undertray and put the wheels back on, before being told that they couldn't do that. Arguments were still ongoing when the second parade lap began, and the race would be decided on aggregate times. This time, it was Prost who got the drop on Senna, chased by Patrese, Nonini and Mansell. As they came round Villeneuve, Senna pulled out an outbreak Prost into Toza, regaining the lead, and with a three-second advantage over Prost on aggregate timings. As before, the two McLarens were rapidly pulling away, this time from Patrese, with Nonini and Mansell hot on his heels. PK was six, but had Warwick close behind, and on lap 7, the third lap of the restarted race, Mansell took Nanini at Toza and managed to make it stick despite a fight back from the Italian. Just then, Guiar was black flagged for having been worked on on the grid, to the aggrieved protests of Guy Ligier, while Martini's good qualifying was all for naught as his gearbox gave out. Mansell was now tucked right up behind Petrese, and although PK and Warwick were still 6th and 7th, Larini was going great guns in the Azella up to 8th ahead of De Cesaris and Chiva, who were in turn being caught by Johnny Herbert, 
on a charge after starting back in 23rd on the original grid and 18th at the second. All these were positions on the road, of course, rather than on aggregate, but the fans at the track certainly appreciated it. Another driver on the move was Jonathan Palmer, who had had problems with the Tyrrell during the first race, but after some setup tweaks, he was now enjoying it and charging up the field. Mansell was already third on aggregate, but wanted to get past Patrese on the track too, and the fans were roaring him on to pass their own countryman Patrese. His new teammate, Bootson, was driving like a man possessed and now overtook Herbert, his superior Renault power telling as they blasted round Tamburello. Indeed, Patrese was able to stay ahead of Mansell too. The Williams was running more wing and Mansell could close up on the infield sections, but Ricardo was staying ahead on the straights without too much drama. 19 seconds up the road, Prost had set a series of fastest laps, breaking the lap record on lap 13, and was still firmly in the wheel tracks of his teammate, but would need to get past Senna and then pull out a lead of four seconds or so if he wanted to take the win. He was certainly going to give it a go, arriving right on Senna's gearbox on lap 16. So there were now two two-way scraps at the front between Senna and Prost and between Patrese and Mansell. Down the order, there was a fine four-way battle going on led by Caffey, followed by Modena, Palmer and Brundle, when the lead Brabham's brakes seized and pitched Modena into the wall, fortunately only hitting at a glancing blow and ending up harmlessly in a sand trap, shaken but otherwise fine. A couple of laps later, Patrese suddenly slowed, allowing Mansell to surge past, and once again poor Ricardo's retirement in front of a home crowd was greeted by cheers, as a Ferrari was the beneficiary. At least unlike back in 1983 when he'd lost the win to Tombe, the fans at the track clapped him back to the pits. They weren't in a generous mood for long, though, because Mansell only lasted another couple of laps before his semi-automatic gearbox gave out and he rolled to a stop. All of which meant that Senna and Prost now led third place Nanini by about 45 seconds on aggregate, with Piquet fourth, Warwick fifth and Boots are now up to sixth. Larini was still well up in eighth between Cheever and Herbert, the last unlapped driver. The leaders were coming through traffic and as usual Senna was more incisive, allowing him to pull away a little and get a bit of a breather, but Prost was still lapping quickly, breaking the lap record again on the way. Nelson Piquet dropped out of fourth with a Judd engine failure at about half distance, just as Senna lapped Herbert, who celebrated shortly afterwards by spinning at the toes of end. Stuck on the track, he was pushed by the marshals, did a spin turn, got stuck again and finally got moving in 14th place, but had to come in to have his car checked over. By this time, Senna had got well ahead of Prost in the traffic and Alan had it to do all over again. So, it was Senna, Prost, Nanini, Boots and Warwick and Cheever, with Larini 9th and Palmer 8th as the director let us ride with Cheever a while in the absence of much actually happening on track. Most of the front-running cars were actually mounting cameras in 1989 with a small amount of equivalent ballast on those without. Prost made a meal of lapping a flying Bootsen on about two-thirds distance, and by the time he did so, he was some ten seconds behind Senna on the road, and it seemed like it was all over as a contest. At the front, at least, a charging Palmer had taken six off Cheever on the road, and the American was having his usual minor mechanical gremlins, and dropped behind Tarquini and Caffey, with Larini now also sizing him up. Unbeknownst to the viewers, the reason Prost had dropped back off Senna was actually intermittent brake problems, and on lap 43 they pitched him off the track at the last chicane. He regained the track without too much trouble, but if there was any doubt about the result of the race, that probably settled it. De Cesaris punted Sala into the gravel at about the same time, as Palmer made it up into the point on aggregate as well as the road, but only by a couple of seconds from Caffey, who was chasing hard keen to get his own first point on the board. Brundle retired with no fuel pressure, just four laps from the end, and Larini's great drive was ended with a broken wheel hub just a couple of laps short of the chequered flag. But there were no troubles for the McLarens, as Senna swept home to take an emphatic win some 40 seconds ahead of his teammate, with Nanini third, Bootson fourth, Warwick fifth, and Palmer sixth. Caffey and Tarquini were just outside the points in seventh and eighth, Cheever nursed his sick arrows home ninth, with De Cesaris and Herbert the last runners, and Larini classified 12th. On the podium, there appeared to be some tension between Senna and Prost, who held up his hand in a no-thanks gesture when Senna started spraying champagne at him before walking off face like thunder, refusing to talk to anyone. And the drama wasn't over yet, because Ligier had appealed their disqualification on the grounds that Caffey and Bootsen had been allowed to race, so they were disqualified, lifting Tarquini up to sixth in his first career point, but not for long. The two were reinstated on appeal before the next race in Monaco, and Gabriele didn't have long to enjoy his good fortune. 
So, with the F1 world wondering what had gone on between Senna and Prost, and glad to hear that Berger had sustained some light burns, but nothing too serious, attention turned to the upcoming Monaco Grand Prix in two weeks' time. Imola had been a 1988-style McLaren demonstration, but many pundits were hoping that the cracks that seemed to be showing in the Senna-Prost relationship might make for some interesting fireworks along the way. (laughs) 